you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I rise today with an update on the condition of San Francisco, uh, a city whose fate has been largely shaped by uh, several politicians uh, of prominence here in Washington, D.C. Uh, foremost among them, uh, Vice President Kamala Harris and Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. I think it's important for all Americans to understand the tragedy of San Francisco, what has happened to one of America's most beautiful cities, because the same radical failed policies that have caused San Francisco's decline and collapse are gaining increasing traction uh, in Washington, D.C. So uh, I want to go over just a few of the reasons why it is that, as the San Francisco Chronicle put it last year, this city is, quote, on the verge of collapse. Indeed, in many ways, my entire state of California offers a preview of where our country has been headed. But San Francisco offers an even starker warning. It is the part of our state where failed policies, radical politics, and public corruption are in their most advanced stage, and where residents are most rapidly fleeing. In an article headlined, San Francisco Falls into the Abyss, UCLA economics professor Lee Ohanian writes, quote, no major American city has failed at the same level as Detroit, whose population dropped from 1.85 million people in 1950 to about 630,000 today. Move over, Detroit, he writes. Here comes San Francisco, which lost 6.3% of its population between 2019 and 2021, a rate of decline larger than any two-year period in Detroit's history and unprecedented among any major U.S. city. The city is declining faster than any major U.S. city in the history of our country. And the reasons are not a mystery. Foremost among them are crime, drug addiction, homelessness, waste, unaffordability, failing school, and failing schools, all a result of failed governance. So let's just start with the crime situation in San Francisco, which is a city that has had a, progress a progression of self-described progressive prosecutors, starting with now Vice President Harris, who has used that term to describe herself, progressive prosecutor, uh, followed by uh, others in her mold, George Gascon uh, and then Chesa Bodine, who was ultimately recalled from office uh, by voters. Now, on a state level, California law has essentially legalized many forms of crime, making theft of merchandise below $950 a misdemeanor, as well as the possession of even Class A drugs. In practice, this means offenders are rarely, if ever, prosecuted, and in many cases, businesses have stopped even reporting losses. San Francisco's anti-law enforcement pro uh, policies have compounded these problems. For example, uh, a few years ago, in 2020, San Francisco defunded the police, shifting $120 million away from law enforcement. If you park your car while in the city, the advice is just to leave the doors open and make sure there are no valuables inside. That will at least spare you the cost of replacing your windshield. Last year, the Castro Merchants Association, representing 125 business owners, wrote a scathing, scathing letter regarding the city's failure to address the lawlessness around them. One said, we're just seeing constant vandalism, constant drug use in public, people passed out on the sidewalk, people having psychotic breakdowns, and it's just not something a small business owner should have to deal with. On top of these general problems relating to, re relating to crime, retail theft, car thefts, is the issue of drug use. Walking through San Francisco, you will see open drug use and drug dealing with an open air drug market uh, scene that is so rampant that even last year, Governor Gavin Newsom sent in the National Guard ostensibly to get it under control. While California has among the, most, the highest rates of illegal drug use in the country, San Francisco is well above the national average, with 22% of the population in the San Francisco, Oakland, Fremont area using an illegal drug in the last year. Tragically, the number of overdose deaths has skyrocketed from, 2020, from, from 222 uh, to now 647 in a given year. Things only got worse during the COVID shutdowns as far more people in the city died from overdoses than from COVID. Facing among the most punishing lockdowns in the country, emergency room mental health visits increased substantially, especially for young people. 
It certainly doesn't help matters that the supply of drugs is so abundant thanks to the crisis at our border, largely overseen uh, by uh, this administration's border czar, Vice President Kamala Harris. And it should be noted that San Francisco declared itself a sanctuary city long before California became a sanctuary state. On that note, the current vice president also played a starring role when she was district attorney, abiding by the city's sanctuary policies. And then when she was the state's attorney general, she actually paved the way for California to become a sanctuary state by opposing a federal law meant to stop sanctuary jurisdictions. A third issue that one will confront immediately in San Francisco is homelessness. And this is very much connected to the crisis of crime, drug use, and mental health, the explosion of homelessness in San Francisco. Once again, while California leads the nation in homelessness, San Francisco is worst of all. Between 2005 and 2020, the number of homeless increased from 5,404 to 8,124. During that same period, homelessness declined significantly nationwide. Within a three-year span, complaints of homeless encampments to the city's 311 line increased from two to 62 each and every day. Meanwhile, the share of the homeless population that is unsheltered has also gone up in recent years. Fourthly is the waste situation. Between 2014 and 2018 in San Francisco, calls about human feces doubled to 20,933. $100 million was spent on street cleaning in 2019 alone. In a three-year span, the city replaced 300 lampposts corroded by urine. The overall condition of many areas is something that no American should ever have to experience, especially kids walking to school. Speaking of kids, San Francisco Unified has the second widest achievement gap of any school district in California with over, over 5,000 students. A Cal Matters investigation from 2017 found that San Francisco had the worst black student achievement rate of any county in California. Just 19% of black students in San Francisco passed the state's reading test compared with 31% statewide. This was before COVID. While California was last in the nation in getting students back to school, San Francisco was worst of all, keeping schools closed not only in 2020, but through the end of the 2020-2021 school year. While they refused to actually operate schools, the district instead spent time on a commission to rename them, even proposing taking Abraham Lincoln's name off of an elementary school. The district then came up with a scheme to scam the state by pretending to open for the last two weeks of the school year in order to get millions of dollars in extra funding. Predictably, test scores have since plummeted even further. The citizens of San Francisco, by the way, responded by recalling three of the school board members from office each by over 70% of the vote. A fifth issue is bureaucracy. It costs an estimated $100,000 to build one tiny home for the homeless, 10 times more than even other places in the Bay Area. Almost $1.2 million is the cost to build a single unit of affordable housing. This is the city where it takes 87 permits, 1,000 days of meetings, and 500,000 in fees to build residential housing projects. San Francisco politicians boast that they brought home the bacon when they acquired a one point, brought home a $1.7 million taxpayer-funded toilet. As the San Francisco Chronicle put it, puts it, San Francisco's bureaucracy isn't just incompetent and comically inefficient, it is a corroding force in our life. They say spiritually, yes, but also literally. They call it corruption born of, born of needlessly complicated bureaucracy. The public transportation system is a model of mismanagement, with the Bay Area Rapid Transit facing a $1.1 billion deficit over five years, with trains that are dangerous to ride and that rarely show up on time. No wonder ridership has plummeted, and they're projecting a $728 million deficit, this is for the city of the whole, over, the next two, over a span of two fiscal years. Finally, there's the cost of living. A survey from the Economist Intelligence Unit found that San Francisco is one of the 10 most expensive cities to live in in the world. Average rent for a one-bedroom apartment is over dollars. According to data from the California Association of Realtors, a San Franciscan needs to make nearly $400,000 to buy a median income home. The cost of utilities, groceries, and other goods is also well above the national average. The city has simply become unaffordable for far too many people. Now, this is the political situation. This is the reality on the ground in San Francisco. 
And it is directly linked to the political culture of radicalism that has developed in that city over the course of the last, say, decade and a half. Um, and what's truly alarming is that many of the people who have had positions of leadership, like Gavin Newsom and Kamala Harris and Nancy Pelosi, have assumed greater power over our state and over our country. Indeed, uh, California has seen its own population decline significantly. In fact, we led the nation in outbound U-Haul rentals uh, over the course of four years. As you saw, many of those problems I just discussed for, for uh, San Francisco start to become uh, problems for the entire state and are indeed now starting to become problems for the entire country. Now, I personally believe it's not too late to turn that particular city around. And for proof, you can look at the communities of my district. While California as a whole is declining, and 53 out of 58 of its counties are declining, the vast majority of my district is growing. Placer County and Folsom, for instance, are growing as much as anywhere in the state. Our communities are rated among the best in California to live, raise a family, and retire. While California, as I said, leads the nation in U-Haul departures, Roseville is the second place city in the entire country in U-Haul arrivals. Many of the people leaving San Francisco, in fact, come to my district for safer communities, a more affordable cost of living, better schools, and an overall quality of life. We still face headwinds of misguided policies enacted at the state level, but we strive to use the tools of local governance and community partnerships to do what is best for our citizens. This is the model that our state should strive for, and it's the model that many other states are following. And it's the model for our country to reverse the policies that have gotten us so off track in three years. If we are going to get ourselves back on the right trajectory as a country, then we should indeed look to San Francisco as a model. But it is a model of precisely what not to do.